Hi, it's Angela from the Fort Worth Public Library. Welcome to Opposites Attract. I'm sure you know all about opposites, but we're gonna do a quick test just to make sure. I'm gonna call out something and you call out the opposite. Ready? Down, slow, stop, boring, purple. Ah, did you know that purple has an opposite? Maybe you've made a color wheel before. So we've got our primary colors, yellow, red, and blue, and our secondary colors, orange, purple, and green, and then our tertiary colors in between the secondary colors. Colors that are on opposite sides of the color wheel are called, do you know what they're called? Complementary colors. Now when you put complementary colors together, they get kind of blah. They turn into a neutral tone, like a beige or a gray. But when you put them next to each other, they create a bright and interesting contrast. So for example, I have here a bright orange handkerchief and a bright blue handkerchief. When I put them together, it makes a totally eye-catching combination. You're not gonna walk past something that is blue and orange. The phrase opposites attract is often used to describe people, but so is the phrase birds of a feather flock together. Which one is it? Both phrases can be true of people, but only one can be true of magnets. Now I know a little bit about magnetism, but I thought it would be better for you to hear from an expert. So I asked my friend Joe to come explain. Joe Peterson is a physicist, someone who studies energy, matter, and the way they're related to each other. Take it away, Joe. In this video, we're going to discuss magnetism, what it is, and where we see it in our everyday lives. Magnetism is one part of a fundamental force in nature called electromagnetism. It's just a property that matter has. Certain particles have magnetism, and it describes how these particles interact with other magnets, other magnetic fields around them. Take, for example, the electron. The electron has mass, and therefore it interacts with other objects that have mass through gravity, another fundamental force. Electrons also just have charge. It interacts with other charges through an electric field. Likewise, electrons just have something called a magnetic moment, which allows the electron to interact with other magnets all around it. Electrons are important because they are the mechanism, the, the particle, through which most of our observation of magnetism come from. So what exactly is magnetism? Well, it's this force. How does it behave? Magnetism exists in two flavors, north and south. And like with charge, that has two flavors, positive and negative, opposites attract to one another. Like sides repel one another. So north will repel north, but north will attract south in magnetism. Here, I have two magnets to demonstrate. One's north pole is pointing up, the other's north pole is pointing down. Opposite. So when I bring them together, they're going to attract one another. Here, as I move this one closer, eventually the magnetic field becomes strong enough to overcome friction and pull the two things together. Now, as I rotate this up, now both north poles are pointing up. When this happens, the north poles are going to repel one another. And we see the magnet, as we come closer together, slides across the table, trying to avoid the other magnet. So magnetism describes how two magnets interact with one another and affect one another. Magnetic moments are a little different. They're unique in the sense that they exist only as dipoles, something called a magnetic dipole. What a magnetic dipole is, is both north and south exist as a single unit. This is not like charge. For example, in the electron, the electron has negative charge, and only negative charge. But the magnetic moment 
of the electron has both north and south pole existing in the same unit. They're inseparable. To demonstrate what a dipole looks like, you can imagine if these two dice represented two different charges, one positive and one negative. Independent of one another, they would generate their own electric fields and interact with one another in the like repelling like and the opposites attracting. But if we brought them together and glued them together as a single unit, they would make a dipole, how magnets always are seen. The dipole, the net charge is zero. However, if you're closer to one end than the other, it looks like it has some kind of charge or pole. Okay? And if you rotate over, it has the opposite pole or charge. So usually, magnetic moments are represented as arrows, indicating which direction north is within the dipole. So magnetism exists as part of all electrons. Electrons are building blocks of all atoms everywhere around us. On me, in the camera, on the table, everywhere. Electrons exist everywhere. So why do we not see magnetism everywhere, all around us? Well, it turns out, in materials, most often, electrons tend to pair. And they pair by their magnetic dipoles. If I were to represent one electrons dipole by my finger. Remember, the dipole has both north and south pole. Suppose my, the tip of my finger is a north pole and the base of my finger is a south pole. The electrons tend to pair just like this, where their poles are facing in opposite directions. So in total, it looks like there's zero magnetism. If I were to pull the electrons apart, however, I would see two different magnets. In certain materials, electrons are left unpaired. Not all electrons, but just some electrons are left unpaired. And when they're not paired, they're just sitting here with their poles facing in a certain direction. Now, if the poles are oriented randomly, in the larger material you would still see no magnetism. But if all of the poles are somehow aligned with one another. All of the poles of the unpaired electrons are aligned. All of a sudden, the entire material becomes permanently magnetized. When they're magnetized in this manner, we call them ferromagnets. They have magnetism in the larger body that we can see. So we've already seen an example of two ferromagnets pushing and pulling one another. There are other magnets all around us. For example, the Earth is itself one giant magnet. Inside the Earth's core, there is a spinning ball of molten nickel and iron and cobalt and all these other magnetic materials, and it causes the entire Earth to be magnetized. That magnetization interacts with all of our other ferromagnets. For example, in a compass. In this compass, we have a magnet. That's just a normal ferromagnet like we were playing with before. It's suspended, so it's free to rotate about the axis. It aligns in a particular way. No matter how we rotate, see how the pin stays pointing in the same direction. That's because it's interacting with the Earth's magnetic field. Earth itself is a magnet, and therefore it is interacting with this ferromagnet. Now, we can come in and prove that this is a magnet by having it interact with other magnets. For example, if I pull this one, if I take this in close, I can see that the magnetic field of this ferromagnet is far stronger than the magnetic field of the Earth, and I can make the compass needle move and dance about. Explorers have been using the magnetic properties of the Earth and compasses as a way to find their way around the world for hundreds of years. But magnetism doesn't just lie, or isn't just useful in compasses. It's found its way into many other uses 
that power our lives today. One way we use magnets today is in encoding messages. For example, I've lined up here magnets, eight magnets all together, and in the magnets I've hidden a message. Now, I've mapped North Pole to the digit zero and South Pole to the digit one, and I've used the code called ASCII, which computer scientists are fond of, to encode a single letter in these eight bits. How are we going to read these eight bits? They just look like eight blocks of iron metal, but we can use a detector, and in this case, the compass needle will suffice. If we start from this end and read this way, we can watch as the compass needle adjusts its position to see which digit each of these magnets represent. So, for example, this first digit, the south end of this magnet is pointing here, so the, the magnetic north pole must be facing down. So this digit is zero. As we move across, we see it switches, so the digit one, zero, one, zero, zero, one, one, zero, one. So here we have zero, one, zero, zero, one, one, zero, one. In ASCII code, those digits represent the capital letter M. M for magnetism, of course. Now, this is a very large example of eight zeros and ones put together. In computer programming, eight bits of zeros and one are called a byte. A single bit, a single piece of information communicated in a code. This is a very large scale example of one byte, but in computer science today, you can store millions, billions, even trillions of these bytes in the palm of your hand. So you can transcribe hundreds of thousands of full textbooks into an area that's just the size of your palm. With magnetic storage, you can permanently store bytes onto strips of magnetic tape. But you have to be careful, because if you bring another magnet too close to that tape, you can damage or destroy the information that you've stored. Magnetism is only one part of the total fundamental force electromagnetism. Electromagnetism is the interplay between electricity and magnetism. One can affect the other. When electricity moves, it generates magnetism. If you coil electricity, an electric current, through a wire that loops round and round and round, you can generate something called an electromagnet, a magnet generated from electricity. This has its advantages in that you can tailor not only the strength of the magnet, how strong the magnet is, but you can also tailor when the magnet is turned on, and you can turn it off. With a ferromagnet, it's always on. So, for example, you could create a very strong magnet that picks up very heavy objects, and once you've picked them up, in order to drop them again, all you need to do is turn off the current in the coil and drop the item, because no more magnetism exists. Changing electric fields creates magnetism, but also changing magnetic fields creates electric fields. And this is instrumental in the use of power generation. Here I have an example. Inside this little cavity is a magnet and a coil of copper wire. As I rotate the magnet through the copper wire, an electric field is generated in the wire, and the wire is hooked up and attached to these wires here, which funnel their way outward. Now I've cut these wires in this demonstration, which I've smashed open, 
but these wires would be connected into a light bulb. That's exactly how the insides of this undestructed light look. Now, if I take this and I spin this around, I generate an electric current. So I have here a miniature of a power plant. Hundreds of miles away from where you live, there's a power plant spinning giant turbines of magnets and coils of conductors. The conductors are hooked up through power lines all the way to your home, and they're powering everything in your house. When you flip on the switch of your light bulbs, when you turn on your computer, as you're watching this right now, you're using electricity generated by magnets spinning through a coil of wire. So we've seen that electricity moving can cause magnetism, and moving magnets can cause electricity. And this interweaving of changing magnetic fields and changing electric fields come together in something called electromagnetic radiation when they oscillate together as one. Electromagnetic radiation is otherwise known as light. All the light around you is caused by magnetic fields and electric fields oscillating together. When we set up a wire, an antenna, we can detect these electromagnetic fields because it will oscillate the electrons inside the wire. And we can pick up radio waves, x-rays, microwaves. Our eyes are set to be sensitive to a certain frequency of the electromagnetic spectrum. So as we see, magnetism is an important part of how matter interacts with other matter. It makes up a large portion of what we call physics. It also plays an important role in many of our everyday devices from compasses, which help navigators explore the world, to power plants, which help generate all the electricity that we use in our homes. It is a fundamental instrument in storing data in our computers, and is used for much, much more, including levitation of trains and medical devices. Its role is only expanding in our lives. Thanks for watching this video. Wow, that's amazing. Thanks, Joe. I can't believe magnetism affects our lives in so many ways. I didn't know you could code messages with magnets, but it turns out every time I use my computer, I'm doing it. Now, remember, Joe is a professional. Don't cut any wires at home unless your grown up says it's okay. So, what all do magnets stick to? Try this at home. Grab some magnets off your refrigerator. I have a variety here. Take one of your magnets, I'm gonna use the mushroom here, and grab some stuff from around your house. It can be anything you want, and see if the magnet will stick to it. So I have, let's see, I have a knife. It's not very a strong magnet, but it does stick. The knife says stainless steel. Unicorn poop. No. Wheel of complicating circumstances. No. Now what will magnets stick to? Plastic? Wood? Not even all metals are attracted to magnets. Check out something that's made out of copper or aluminum. They won't stick. To get something to stick to a magnet, it has to be iron, nickel, or cobalt. Now, magnetic metals, things made out of iron, nickel, and cobalt, can become temporary magnets when they're under the influence of a strong magnet. So take this paper clip, for example. The paper clip is made out of steel, which contains iron. It's not a magnet. I can't pick up other paper clips with it. But if it's under the influence of this strong magnet, it can become a magnet and pick up other paper clips. 
You can test to see how strong your magnets are compared to one another by seeing how many paper clips you can hold at one time. So I'm gonna start off with the magnet that I know is probably pretty weak. And here's one. It can hold one paper clip flat. Let's see. Can it hold two? Nope. This is similar to an electromagnet, like the ones Joe talked about. How about the mushroom? This one looks a little bit stronger. Let's see. We got one. One paperclip. And we get two. We cannot. Oh, okay. Two. All right. This is a winner so far. And we get three. Three! We got three. Ah, three it is. Still the strongest magnet though. Now you're gonna wanna know which magnet is your strongest for when we make a compass. I have some heavy duty magnets here. They have the, la the poles here labeled north and south. I'm gonna see how many the heavy duty magnet can do. Four. Okay, the heavy duty magnet can hold four. Let's try for five and see. Just for. Greetings, viewers. It is I, Millicent the Magnificent. Never heard of me? Well, I find that very hard to believe. No matter, you will remember my name today when I make these four ordinary paper clips disappear right before your very eyes. Allah Kazam! Hey, cool! Can you tell the kids at home how you did that? A magician never reveals their secrets. Well, I'll tell you. You'll need your strongest magnet, but it has to be small enough to fit in the palm of your hand. So, position the magnet in your hand in a way that you can hold it without it being seen from above. And this might take some getting used to, depending on the shape of your magnet, the size. This is my strongest magnet that would fit in the palm of my hand. So. I gotta maneuver around this tile. So wave your hands, probably wanna say a magic word or something, and pick up the magnets like that. Now, Joe used a compass to show you how a ferromagnet interacts with the Earth's magnetic field. I'm gonna show you how to make your own compass at home. You'll need a glass or a plastic bowl full of water, a plastic lid, a sewing needle, and the strongest magnet you can find. Rub the needle across the magnet the same way about 20 to 30 times. You want it to be a strong temporary magnet. Then put the magnetized needle onto the plastic lid and float the lid in the bowl of water. It'll take some time, but eventually the needle will swing around to point to north. I've put the compass on my phone here for comparison. Now I hope you enjoyed learning a little more about magnetism. Keep experimenting with magnets at home. Who knows, maybe one day you'll be a physicist like Joe. Thanks for joining us everyone!